As the family of today's murder victim made an emotional and tearful statement in court, the killer sat just a few feet away from them, smiling and laughing about what he'd done. Today, we're gonna to be talking about the murder of Jordan Clee. But quickly, before we get into the case, I do just wanna thank our sponsors for making this video possible, NordVPN. If you go to nordvpn.com forward slash Eleanor, that is the link that is down below in the description box, there'll be an exclusive deal waiting for you there and it is completely risk-free with NordVPN's 30-day money-back guarantee. Right now, for the new year, it is one bonus month free. Having a VPN is so useful for so many reasons. The main thing that I kind of use it for is accessing more of the internet, accessing more of streaming service selections specifically. I love using this on Netflix. Cause each country has such a different Netflix catalog and you don't know how many like good films your country is missing until you Google what other countries have and it's like, I want that. But you can with a VPN, that's my whole point. If you use a VPN, it makes it appear as though you're operating from a different country. So then you can use the internet as though you're in that country. So basically how it works, all you need to do is open the NordVPN app and with one click, you appear as though you're operating from a different country. Like I said, it's literally that easy. And this comes with a whole load of like security and safety benefits as well. It means that there's kind of a block put between you and anyone that's trying to hack you or access your private personal information. And NordVPN also acts as a really good cyber security tool as well. There's a lot of threat protection features that you can benefit from, such as checking your downloads for potential malware, making sure that you're downloading safe things onto your computer. Computer. It also blocks intrusive ads. Just loads of like annoying and suspicious, scary things don't have to worry you anymore if you have NordVPN. I have been peacefully using the internet for a long time now. And it also just helps you watch more shows. There's no reason to not want a VPN. So like I said, if you go to nordvpn.com forward slash Eleanor, the link is also down below. There will be an exclusive deal waiting for you there and it is completely risk-free with NordVPN's 30 day money back guarantee. Right now for the new year, it is one bonus month free. So don't miss out, go click the link. Thanks again to NordVPN for sponsoring this video. Now, before we get into it, I do just wanna give my usual disclaimer that I mean absolutely no disrespect to anyone that I talk about in this video. This video is for educational purposes and everything that I'm about to say is just information that I have found on the internet and I'm compiling into one video. So today's case takes place in a city called Ann Arbor in Michigan. Actually, I think you're supposed to say it more like all one word, Ann Arbor. An in 2016, this is where 18 year old Jordan Michael Clee lived with his mother, Karen Clee. Sadly, Jordan's father passed away a few months before he was born on July 26th, 1998. So he never actually got to meet his father, of course, but he wasn't without a father figure. He had his grandfather, his mother's father, who did a lot with him as he was growing up. That was practically his dad. And his mother, Karen, also tried to give Jordan the absolute best life that she possibly could. Even though now she was a widowed mother doing it all on her own, she gave it her absolute best. Growing up, Jordan was a very adventurous kid. He was very hyperactive. He was always running around, climbing trees. He was, he was a very sporty, like athletic, very, you know, just one of them energetic kids that's always onto something new. He really enjoyed sports particularly. He was really good at biking. He was really good at skiing, both of which his granddad taught him how to do. He was on the football team. He was really good at football. Yeah, he was a really good athlete in high school, like one of the best football players on their team. And he won a bunch of awards for it as well. He was really popular among his football team, they all loved him. And he was very academically gifted as well. He always got really good grades. Basically, Jordan just applied himself in every area of his life. He was determined to do well and be successful at whatever he put his mind to. And he really was. Although sometimes he would get in a little bit of trouble in class for like daydreaming and 
slacking off a little bit. He would like play with things on his desk, fidget, make little like, I don't know, I used to do this on my desk as well. Like just pick a load of like random little things that you can get your hands on. And I used to like try and make them into something. I was a loser, I was a loser. But Jordan did it too, so it made me feel better about myself. Jordan was really, really good at maths. He enjoyed anything that was kind of like mathsy based. So even like physics and he really liked engineering. He decided that he was gonna study an engineering course and that was gonna be the career that he was gonna head into because he knew it was well paying and he found it pretty easy. Like he was good at it, so why not? So that was the plan to just keep grinding out high school and then he was gonna go off to college. He was gonna go to Michigan University where again, he was gonna study engineering. He had plans to join the football team there too and play for his university now. And he knew he was gonna be good at it as well. Like he was really excited for some of the games that he was gonna be involved in. But unfortunately, Jordan Cleese he wouldn't even make it to his high school graduation. Around 3 p.m. on October 4th, 2016, there was a maintenance worker on shift at an apartment complex called Pine Lake Village in Ann Arbor. He'd been there pretty much all day at this point and most of his jobs had been inside the building, so he'd been working away. And then at some point he walks outside the building and that was when he saw a young man laying on the ground not moving. So the worker ran over to the boy and quickly noticed a pool of blood around his head. And there was one singular gunshot wound right in the middle of his forehead. This boy had been shot and killed. He was already dead. The maintenance worker knew that there was no saving this boy, yet he still called for every emergency service that he possibly could. Police came down and an investigation was opened. Immediately, this case was ruled as a homicide because of course, he was shot in the head and there was no gun found laying around. So it wasn't like he'd shot himself. It was clear that someone else had shot him in the head and run away, taken the weapon away with them. Police spoke with the maintenance worker, obviously that found him and also a bunch of people in the apartment building, but no one had really seen much. However, a few people had heard what they believed to be a gunshot about an hour before the body was found. So at around 2 p.m. they recalled hearing what they thought in the moment could have been a gunshot. It was kind of, the way that they all described it, it was like, it could have been a gunshot, but it also just could have been a loud noise outside and I didn't want to overreact. So I just kind of ignored it. There was about two people, maybe three, that heard this gunshot. So now, after finding this body, they all knew that it was a gunshot that they'd heard, but at the time, it, it could have been something else, so they didn't report it. When the young man's body was taken for autopsy, they were able to identify him as 18-year-old Jordan Michael Clee. Jordan's family were informed of his passing and the circumstances in which he had been found dead, and aside from all of the obvious emotions that they would be feeling right now, shock, devastation, heartbreak, they were also just generally very confused. As far as his family were aware, Jordan should have been in school that day. This was a school day and it was the middle of the day when he was shot and killed. Why was he at some random apartment complex that they'd never heard of and not in class? He had got up and got ready and left for school that morning. So what had happened during the day that had meant that he didn't actually end up at school, he'd ended up in this other random place shot dead. His family really racked their brains and they just couldn't think of any connection that Jordan could have had to Pine Lake Village apartment complex. He didn't know anyone that lived there. He didn't have any friends that lived there. He had absolutely no business being there. There was nothing about these circumstances that was in keeping with Jordan's character. He wasn't the type to skip school and bunk off and go meet friends or whatever. It, everything was so confusing to his family. But they couldn't even really think about that. They were too busy dealing with the, the very sudden loss of someone that they loved. Jordan's mother told police that he was a very loving, very kind, very friendly person that didn't have enemies. He didn't have people that didn't like him, people that wanted to hurt him, people that wanted him gone. That wasn't the kind of boy he was. He was nice to everyone he came in contact with. Cause to be honest, in the beginning, police kind of thought that this was probably like gang related or feud related. Like maybe he was a member of one gang and then another gang didn't like him. And so they've tracked him down and shot him and kill him. But his mom was saying, no, that's that's not my son at all. He wasn't in gangs. He didn't, he didn't run with bad kids. Like he was a good kid himself, all his friends were good kids 
And this was just, this was nothing like his life. So it couldn't have been anything like his lifestyle and his choices led to this. Honestly though, what seemed to be the most likely motive was that maybe this was an armed robbery gone wrong. I mean, it did happen in the street in the middle of the day. Whoever had done it, whoever had shot and killed Jordan had run away pretty quickly, gotten out of there. They hadn't moved his body at all. I don't actually know if he was robbed. I couldn't find that anywhere on the internet because surely that would tell us if it was a robbery or not. Like if his wallet's gone, then it was a robbery, but I'm not sure. But that also kind of leads me to believe that nothing was stolen because if something was stolen, it would be in the reports and it would be in the articles. Unless it was a, an armed robbery where they were gonna rob him, but then they shot him first and panicked. Maybe that wasn't what they meant to do, so they just ran away without actually robbing him. I don't know, I'm really kind of getting ahead of myself, but that's because this case really confuses me. But whatever the circumstances, this was an innocent 18 year old boy with a bright future in front of him that was ripped away by someone that had just shot him in the middle of the street and ran away. And police were determined to find the person that had done this and bring them to justice. Police were very tight-lipped about this one particular investigation since they had all these kinds of theories that it could have been gang-related and stuff like that. A lot of them had been mostly ruled out, but they, they were also keeping their cards very close to their chest for a lot of reasons. I mean, it's always kind of good to do that in a lot of police investigations, unless releasing information will help bring more information forward, then I think it's always quite useful to, to keep what they know close. And so for that reason, I don't really have much information about the investigation and kind of what led police to do this, but about a week after the murder, police announced that they had made three arrests. The youngest of these three boys was 17 year old Dan to Wright, and the other two were a bit older than him, I believe, although I couldn't actually find specific ages online. Their names were Jamarius Ellison and Delrano Gracie. The police had actually already worked out this friend group a little bit, this little trio. They'd been doing their research and they believed that the youngest one, the 17 year old Dan to Wright, they believed he was the ringleader of the group. He was the brains. Dante was actually in the same school year as Jordan Clee, so he too was due to sit his exams and graduate and have prom and then go off to college next year. I don't know if he was going to the same school, so I don't know if he knew who Jordan Clee was, but they were exactly the same age. But instead of attending his prom and his graduation, Dante Wright would be standing trial for the murder of an innocent man. Police believe that this was an attempted robbery performed by all three of the boys that I mentioned. And they believe that ringleader Dan to Wright was the one that managed to get hold of the firearm so that they could use it that day. And he was also the one that discharged it. So he was the one that shot Jordan Clee once in the middle of the forehead, killed him immediately. So he was the murderer and he was the one that was expected to fare the worst. At trial. And honestly, Dan to Wright is so unlikable. This man is just so cocky and arrogant. He has no empathy. He is so emotionless and narcissistic. I could keep going. I really don't like him. He was a pain in the ass from start to end of this investigation. It seemed as though he was gonna be trouble. As it led up to his trial, it was looking like he was gonna plead not guilty, even though police had supposedly a decent amount of evidence against him. I don't know exactly what they had, but he he was seeming like he was, he was hinting that he was gonna plead not guilty. Now the problem with this is, or the reason that that's annoying to police is because they had the evidence to say that he did it, but he could, Danta could drag this out as long as he wanted. He knew that this was painful for his victim's families, yet he didn't care. He had no empathy. He wanted to drag it out. He wanted to make a scene. Even though he could have pled guilty then and there, he didn't wanna. He wanted the attention and the limelight, you know? So they thought he was gonna plead not guilty. That was what he was hinting the whole time. But actually, on the day of the trial, he got up there and shocked everyone when he pled guilty. He stood up there and confessed to the murder of Jordan Clee. He told his version of events and he admitted that yes, it was an armed robbery gone wrong and that the other two boys were involved. And he actually admitted that he intentionally shot Jordan Clee in the head that day. Like he hadn't started the altercation thinking he was gonna shoot him in the head, 
But he said that when he did, like when he raised that gun, he aimed at his head intentionally. He wanted to shoot this boy in the head. Knowing that a shot to the head is almost impossible to survive, knowing that he was about to kill this boy, he still lifted that gun, aimed at his head, and pulled the trigger. When you're shooting someone in the head, you know that that shot is gonna kill them. You aim for the head when you're shooting to kill. And of course, once the gun went off, Jordan died immediately. As soon as that bullet went through his brain, he died and dropped to the floor. And that was when those three boys realized what they'd just done. They had just committed murder. All three of them panicked a bit and just ran away, just left this 18 year old boy's body on the ground and they all ran away. Dante was asked if he knew that he'd killed Jordan Clear, or if he thought he'd just kind of left him for dead and that maybe he might recover. And Jordan said in court that no, he knew he'd killed Jordan. As soon as he fired that shot and saw Jordan fall to the ground, he knew he was dead. He knew he'd just committed murder. In the court hearing, Jordan's mother, Karen Clee, wanted to stand up there and read a victim impact statement. She'd written this speech about how the loss of her son had affected her life so much and about how these three boys had, had ruined her life. Not only her son's life, they'd ruined so many people's lives shooting her son. So she'd written this really powerful speech. However, on the actual day, she was so emotional, she couldn't stop crying all day long enough to give this speech. And so instead, Karen's cousin actually got up and read this statement on her behalf. And you'll see in these videos that Karen is stood to the side of her, literally sobbing the whole way through. It's heartbreaking. I've lost laughter and love. I no longer have the hope of having grandchildren. I've lost the enjoyment of holidays and birthdays and of everyday life. I've seen your pictures with prom and graduation and parties. Instead, it was a nightmare, a nightmare that no parent should ever endure. In this speech, she talks about how Jordan was like her best friend. He always cared for her, always did things for her. He would bring her milkshakes home, like on his way home from work, cause he knew that she liked them. He would make her laugh when she was feeling down. She said that she was always really looking forward to having grandkids, but now the chances of her ever having them is gone. Karen herself is sobbing all the way through this. Meanwhile, Dante Wright is smirking, laughing, rolling his eyes just a few feet away, being so disrespectful. And he also got up and made a statement himself at one point. I just wanna tell y'all, I'll be home soon, RP Keon, I love my family. Apparently everyone in that courtroom could feel the tension, feel the anger. Everyone was angry at Dante Wright for acting this way, especially in front of his victim's family. He wasn't taking this seriously. He wasn't realizing the gravity of what he'd done. He had killed a young man and he was just laughing at his victim's family's pain. It even got to the point where the judge himself called Danta out for this. But watching you sit there, smile, and laugh, and shake your head like this was no big deal, I'm very tempted to just say, I'm not gonna accept this sentence agreement, we'll go to trial, and if you're convicted of felony murder, you'll go to prison for the rest of your life. That means you'll die there. After this, Jordan's defense attorney actually had to get up and make an apology on behalf of his client, he had to apologize to the judge and the whole courtroom. His smiling was in no way meant as disrespectful either to the family, to the victim, or to this court. At the end of this trial, Dante Wright was found guilty of armed robbery. And for that, he was sentenced to 50 years in prison with a minimum of 23. I believe he had a sentencing plea, which made his sentence lower than it otherwise would have been. Although I don't know the details of that sentencing plea. Perhaps he gave up information on his accomplices or something, I don't know. Speaking of, they were both also found guilty and they were both sentenced to 40 years with a minimum of 15. And in the aftermath of all of this, there's actually been another unexpected villain raise their head in this story. Danta Wright's own mother. She's done interviews where she has been asked how she feels about her son's victim's family. So the other mum, you know, who is now dealing with the loss of her child, how does she feel about her son's actions like that? And the things that she says are just so lacking empathy. They're just 
almost as bad as her son. She says a lot of things like, my son was supposed to graduate this year too, and now I, I'm without my son too. What do you think about his reaction uh, during the statements that were made in the court that the uh, judge seemed to be upset about? Yeah, tell me what you think. What upset me was, I'm, just, I'm sorry for her loss, just as well as mine. My son was supposed to graduate this year too. Yes, we can all understand and acknowledge that your son is away in prison for the next 40 years and you're not going to see him much. But how bloody tone deaf can you get when a reporter is asking you how you feel about your son murdering this other innocent young man and you're, and you're just stood there going, well, I have problems too. Jordan Clee's family will never get to see their son again, never get to hear his voice, never get to hear his laugh ever again. You get visitation rights with your son at prison. You get to have phone calls with your son in prison. Like it's one thing for her to feel sad in private that her son is now in prison for a very, very long time. I think most mothers would be heartbroken over that but it's a totally different thing to then vocalize that in an interview where you have specifically been asked about the effect of your son's actions on the grieving family. Don't then make it about yourself. You're practically rubbing your half loss in the face of the family who have lost Jordan Clee forever. They will never get their boy back. You will one day. She actually maintains that her son is innocent um, and actually committed the shooting because of mental illness that wasn't properly investigated. What? What the hell is she on about? The mental health has not been brought up once in this case. This was an armed robbery that your son has admitted to, confessed to. There's never been any mention of mental health, mental illness. That just absolutely i just i can't make heads or tails of that he got hold of a gun prior to that event and took it out intending to use it in some capacity this is not a result of mental illness at all she even said that that's why her son was smiling in court it wasn't because he was being rude and disrespectful it was his mental illness but she never she never once elaborates what this mental illness supposedly is she just says mental illness mental illness one that's never been diagnosed he's I'm, you, you know, you know, you know, I'm gonna leave it there. But there's one last thing that I do wanna talk about that I have touched on in this, like, as I've been telling this case, but one thing that really confuses me and that I wish we had more answers on was why Jordan Clee was even at that apartment complex that day anyway, when he was supposed to be in school and he was intending to go to school. What happened that put him there at the apartment complex where he was later shot and killed? I don't get it. I don't get it. Was he lured there, potentially, by Dante Wright and his two accomplices? We don't know. There's never been any evidence found of that, I will say. Like, there's never been any, like, texts where they've, like, tried to lure him out or, like, planned this in advance. There hasn't been any evidence of anything like that, which is why this is such a question mark still. Evidence in this case really does make it seem like it was just a, an armed robbery gone wrong. So, I, I don't know. Jordan did seem to be like, in the wrong place at the wrong time kind of situation, but why was he there? Why was he in the wrong place at the wrong time? And why was he not at school? That's never been explained. And he wasn't the kind of boy to just bunk off. So, I don't know, that's one thing that I really wish was answered, but all that being said, this case is officially solved and that is all I have on it. But yeah, that's everything I have on this case. But quickly before I go, I do just wanna let you guys know that I have a second channel, if you didn't already know. A lot of you are already over there and we've been having a party over there for a good couple of months now. I'm really enjoying it. I do like um, advice videos, vlogs, I do little podcast episode type things where I get like, really personal about like my life and like my mental health and things that I've been through. It's just like a little FaceTime chat and my podcast episodes, I love them. Um, the link will be down below in the description to my second channel. I'll see if I can put a little circle on the screen at some point. Um, but yeah, thanks again to NordVPN for sponsoring this video. Remember, if you go to nordvpn.com forward slash Eleanor, the link is also down below in the description. You will get an exclusive deal and it's completely risk-free with NordVPN's 30 day money back guarantee. Right now for the new year, it is one bonus month free. You don't wanna miss out on that. 
Thanks again to NordVPN. A huge thank you to all of my channel members for supporting the channel and helping me decide the cases that I cover. All of my tier two members are on screen right now, so thank you so much. If you wanna become a channel member, you can click the join button down below. But yeah, thank you so, so much for watching. If you enjoyed, please leave a thumbs up down below. That would really help me out. If you wanna subscribe, I post true crime content all the time. You can click this circle with my face in. One of them, actually. It's uh, the one where I'm wearing red lipstick. I don't know, I've probably managed to put my second channel on there too, so click that one. Subscribe to that one and all. Um, and then there's another true crime video if you wanna watch that one after this. Okay, bye.